True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Take me back to that day. What, what day was it about and, and what were you doing? It was early spring. We had just gotten home from work. Um, I dropped her off. She went in and made um, Thumper some scrambled eggs and some toast. And then we had walked into the back. Their trailer had the living room in the back. Thumper was in there watching the news. And uh, we just started talking. Something came across the news about Heidi. Um, and Vicki and I were actually talking amongst ourselves. And we were just basically making a comment about we wonder what happened to her. Once we had said that, James Steen became irate. He turned around and said, you want to effing know what happened to her? We were like, well, yeah. And he just started blurting it out. He said that him, Michael Bohr, and Roger had taken Michael Bohr's uh, van early in the morning to the store. He said they pulled up between the double doors and left the back doors open, and Mike left, was in the vehicle with the van running at the store. And that he had gone into the side door. Roger went into the front to distract her. He said when he went, in around the uh, counter to get her, he grabbed her like this. He said, I grabbed her like this. He said, once I grabbed her like this, he said, Roger jumped over the counter, proceeded to grab her too. They dragged her out the side door. Then he laughed and said, he hit the van real hard with her. Once they hit the van real hard, he said, Mike took off like a bat out of hell. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Before we begin, I'd like to tell our listeners about MyFit Jeans. These jeans are made from the softest fabric called Flex Tech Denim, and they're designed to fit all women. I'm not kidding about that. Whether you're at your fittest or having kind of a bloated, icky day, MyFit Jeans conform to your curves and they feel just great. I love their wide waistband too because it prevents any chance of a muffin top. You're going to love MyFit Jeans, and now they're offering our listeners an exclusive deal. Buy one pair and get 15% off. If you buy two pair, you get 50% off on the second pair as well. Just go to MyFitJeans.com and enter code BREWERY for 15% off your first pair plus 50% off your second pair. That's MyFitJeans.com and promo code BREWERY. This holiday season, give the gift of safety with Sabre, the number one brand of pepper spray used by police and consumers worldwide. Sabre offers maximum strength pepper spray and gel, as well as some other great devices to keep everyone safe this season and throughout the year. Their attention-grabbing personal alarms are audible up to 1,000 feet away. They also have easy-to-install home security options, great for those of us who aren't very handy around the house, like me. <laughs> Go to sabered.com slash truecrimebrewery and use code TRUECRIME to get 20% off your order. That's S-A-B-R-E, red, dot com, slash, true crime brewery. 18-year-old Heidi Allen was employed as a clerk at the D&W convenience store in New Haven, New York. She opened the store by herself at 5.45 a.m. on April 3, 1994, and her last transaction was recorded on the cash register at 7.42 a.m. Several customers came and went after that, leaving cash for their purchases on the counter when they couldn't find a clerk. Finally, a customer flagged down a sheriff's patrol car outside the store at a little after 8 a.m. and reported that the business was open but unattended. The investigation into Heidi's disappearance would reveal that Heidi was likely taken against her will from the store. Her jacket, purse, and car keys were left behind in the store when she vanished, and her maroon station wagon was in the parking lot. The primary suspect was the last customer known to be in the store before Heidi vanished. He told police that he had purchased two packs of cigarettes around 7.30 a.m. and left. But detectives did not believe him. But there may have been more to Heidi's story than just a random abduction. There was something about Heidi that most people didn't know. Heidi was working as an informant for the police. Was Heidi the target of drug dealers who wanted to keep her quiet? Join us at the quiet end today for Where's Heidi? The Kidnapping of Heidi Allen. Today's beer is another New York beer called Between the Dead brewed by Finback Brewery in Queens. This is an imperial stout. I haven't done one for a while. I just couldn't resist. Mm, I know. They're one of your favorites. So this one, uh, Between the Dead, is 
their basic stout, which is called Harambe, but it's aged in bourbon barrels with coconut and a little bit of cinnamon and vanilla. Very nice. So the beer pours a very dark black with a two-inch tan head. Aroma is very nice, chocolate, coconut, and bourbon. Taste follows the nose pretty faithfully. There's also a hint of fruit. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Do you like it? Yeah, I do. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not something that's really glaring, but it's, it's there. This is a very nice stout, easy to drink, and I'm happy to share it with you. Okay, let's open it right up. Okay. Let's go down to the quiet end. Off we go. Off we go, and I'm going to let you start off our story. Okay. Heidi Allen was 18 years old and worked at the local convenience store full-time to pay her way through college. She had attended a private Catholic high school until it closed in her junior year. So at that point, she could either return to public school or apply for college a year early at the end of her junior year. She opted for that. In 1993, she applied for early admissions at a local community college. She was accepted and was allowed to complete her senior year of high school and her first year of college in that one year. She worked hard. Heidi earned her high school diploma as well as honors in her college courses. She was a full-time student, but she still managed to work full-time to pay for her own tuition. She also volunteered at the Academy Street Elementary School, where she helped children who were affected by divorce. So she sounds like a pretty good kid. Doesn't she? Yep. So Heidi's parents and her older sister Lisa last saw Heidi on April 2nd, 1994, the day before she'd vanished. She came by the house with Brett, that's her boyfriend, and passed out Easter candy and gifts as she sang, Here Comes Peter Cottontail. (laughs) So at 5 a.m. on April 3rd, the next day, Heidi opened up the D&W convenience store, and this was Easter Sunday. Her boyfriend, Brett, came along to keep her company until the store got busy, which he'd done that before. And Brett left the store around quarter after seven, knowing that Heidi had opened up safely and customers were coming and going. The couple planned to meet later in the afternoon. They were going to deliver Easter baskets to Brett's nieces and nephews. Heidi's last transaction registered at 7.42 a.m. Customers continued to enter the store, just as they did every Sunday, but the clerk behind the counter was missing. Some customers called out, while others just left cash on the counter. Finally, one customer thought that something was wrong here, so... He saw the money pulling up on the counter. There's no sign of anyone there. He ran outside and flagged down a sheriff's deputy, who just happened to be driving down the road. Heidi had left her car keys on the counter, and her station wagon was outside. Nothing in the store appeared out of place. Hundreds of people searched for her, and there was no success. Flyers with her picture were posted across the eastern United States, but there were very few leads. Complete strangers set aside their lives to help with this search. Everyone was working tirelessly to find Heidi. A sheriff in town, Sheriff Nellis, reminded the search teams and Heidi's family, Heidi Allen is missing, and this is a forcible abduction. Each minute that she is missing, the less likely she is to return. Time is of the essence. In situations like this, it always is. Yes. So Richard and Gary Thibodeau, were both arrested for Heidi's kidnapping. Authorities believe that Richard Thibodeau made the last purchase from Heidi, two boxes of cigarettes at 7.42 a.m. Then he and his brother Gary forced Heidi out of the store and into a van. It's sort of ironic. Richard Thibodeau had actually contacted the police after hearing that Heidi was missing. He gave the details of his purchase, and he described a man who held the door open for him. And this was verified by the other customer, who said that Richard was alone. Richard's brother Gary was supposedly at home that Easter morning, and he had an alibi, which was backed up by family members. So this is an important thing to remember as we get into this case, is that nobody saw Gary there, and Gary had an alibi. Now it was family members, so I guess that's taken with a grain of salt, because lots of times family members will lie for you. Sure. But still, nobody saw Gary there, and I think that's very interesting as we move forward. A witness saw two men leading a young woman into a van, but couldn't identify the woman or the men. Police believe that the Thibodeau brothers put Heidi into Richard's white and black van, 
then drove to Gary's house in the town of Mexico, New York, about eight miles away. A witness saw a two-tone van swerving through the village of Mexico, with the driver apparently struggling with something behind him. Then several neighbors reported seeing a white and black van parked in Gary Thibodeau's driveway that morning. So that might be part of the reason why Gary and Richard were looked at so early. Yeah, I mean, they had the van seen at the convenience store, right? Right. And then later on at Gary's house. But Richard said he was there. He wasn't trying to hide that at all. Right. And no one saw Gary with him. You're right. But we'll go over all the witnesses a little later, and we'll see that this is very complicated. It's like peeling an onion or something. (laughs) Every layer has something different. So hours later, Gary Thibodeau and his girlfriend drove to Massachusetts, where Gary was originally from, and their 1983 Cadillac broke down there. They had to replace the drive shaft two days later on April 5, 1994, according to a receipt from a mechanic shop in Lemonster, Massachusetts. And a day later, a witness claimed that he saw Richard Thibodeau and another man, believed to be Gary, carrying a long object in clear plastic into the woods in Palermo. It was about 10 a.m. on April 6th. The object was 8 to 10 feet long, covered in clear plastic, and tied with what appeared to be a rope at both ends, the witness described. But then a search of that woods and that entire area found only some clothing, which turned out did not belong to Heidi. So that seems like it was a dead end or a red herring, whatever you want to call it. Now at trial, two inmates would testify against Gary Thibodeau, saying that he talked about Heidi Allen's disappearance when he was in a Massachusetts jail. He was in the jail in Massachusetts for some kind of drug charge, possession, I believe. And these inmates claimed that Gary told them Heidi was using drugs and that he killed her in a drug deal gone bad. Gary Thibodeau denied that he ever said that, though, later on when he took the stand in his own defense. Now, the Thibodeau brothers were tried separately, and Gary's trial was first. When Gary Thibodeau was found guilty, a jury said that it wasn't one thing that convinced the panel of his guilt, as much as testimony from witnesses that had no personal interest in the case. And these witnesses would include neighbors, the witnesses at the store, those who saw the van after the kidnapping, And, of course, the jailhouse snitches. Yeah, well, okay. We're going to go over some of this again. Yeah? What are you thinking? Well, I'm I'm thinking I I hardly ever would believe jailhouse snitches because they have an ulterior motive, generally. Well, even if they're not getting anything, I, I kind of agree with you because they're getting to leave the jail, they're getting some attention. So even if they're not getting any kind of deal, if they don't like the guy, there are many reasons that they might lie. And lots of times people in jail are not the most honest people, let's be real. Yeah, you're right. And then, uh, again, we'll we'll talk about this some more, but the van that was seen at the store and the the, uh, van that might have been involved in the abduction probably weren't the same vehicle. Yes, we're definitely going to get into that. There are witnesses. So while both brothers were accused of carrying out Heidi's kidnapping, the evidence against them was actually very different. Richard Thibodeau admitted that he was at the scene and he had a receipt from his purchase of cigarettes. Authorities had no proof that Gary was there at all. Both brothers claimed they were not together that morning at the store or anywhere else. Yeah, and Gary said he never went to the store that day. Instead, he had slept in and he got woken up by a call from his brother about what had been going on at the store. By then, word was getting out about Heidi Allen's disappearance. Gary claimed the brothers never used Heidi's name in that conversation. He said that the neighbors were all mistaken about Richard's van being in the driveway that morning. In fact, he said that happened a week later. Richard Thibodeau said he'd never gone to his brother's house that day. After returning from the store with his cigarettes, Richard spent a short while at home. One witness testified the van passed by in New Haven about the same time Neighbors of Gary say the van was at his residence in Mexico, which you said was a few miles away. So after returning from the store, Richard Thibodeau said his family drove to the house of his girlfriend's relatives for Easter dinner. On the way, he saw the police tape at the convenience store and called deputies to give a statement. So he's, at least from his telling, he's trying to be a good guy and help the police out. Right, right. Richard did later give fingerprint, blood, and pubic hair samples to authorities, 
and his van was searched, and there was no trace of Heidi Allen in it. So there's really no forensics here. Zero. His lawyer, Walsh, also pointed out witnesses that had testified that his van went from the store to his brother's house, eight miles away, in just four minutes. Now that's not possible. Walsh also pointed out at least two other similar-looking vans that were investigated by authorities. So it's not the only van in town. No, it certainly wasn't. And for his part, Gary Thibodeau also denied ever going to Massachusetts. While prosecutors said he bought a drive shaft there, no name was actually on the receipt proving he was there. Interesting. And a salesperson at Goldberg's Furniture testified seeing his then-girlfriend Sharon in Oswego the same day that prosecutors said that Gary and Sharon were in Massachusetts. Two bank employees and an insurance agent also recorded transactions on her account that day, locally. So we don't even think he was in Massachusetts at that time. Right. Although he did go back and was in the jail. And Richard Thibodeau also denied ever carrying an object into the woods in Palermo three days later. His boss testified that Richard had been working in Liverpool that day, though the boss acknowledged he hadn't watched him the whole day. Well, remember, they had searched that area, so if they'd taken a body into the woods there, wouldn't there have been some sign, even if they tried to burn her or whatever? Would think so, They would have right? found something. Yeah, because they didn't come out of the woods with what they went into the woods with. Yeah, so I feel like that totally compromises that witness. Yeah. And I think people want to be helpful and unknowingly make things up. You know what I mean? They kind of exaggerate things. They change their memories to fit. It happens, even if they're not doing it on purpose. Well, and, and along with that, I think that when you get to a jury, that they really want to find someone guilty. They want to find someone who could have done the crime. Right, exactly. So Richard Thibodeau was found not guilty, even though they were supposed to have done this kidnapping together, and Gary was found guilty. So I don't know if this was just a case of different jury, different result, but we'll find out later that maybe they didn't have the same evidence either. Well, but it, it just boggles my mind. It really is boggling. They've been accused of this crime. They acted together, allegedly. That's what the jury in Gary's case said. And... They find one brother guilty and one not guilty. And the one they found not guilty is the one that admits he was there. Right. So it I just, is I don't know super how you, how messed you can up. arrive at that conclusion. I don't know. It makes our justice system look terrible because it doesn't make sense. Not in the least. So the motive of a drug deal gone bad, as testified to by the jail snitches, didn't make any sense. There was no indication that Heidi did drugs or dealt drugs. So the motive would be unknown, and even the prosecutor would admit that. There was no forensic evidence connecting either brother to Heidi's abduction. There was also no evidence that Gary had been in the store or with his brother, remember? That's right. But shockingly, the prosecution seemed satisfied with their conviction of Gary Thibodeau. And Richard Thibodeau lived in fear of being accused in crimes against Heidi, and he and his family were ostracized in the community. Now remember, they were taken to trial for first-degree kidnapping. So if a body of Heidi was found, Richard could be brought back right, for trial. Right, because he was acquitted. Right, but this wouldn't be the same crime, right? So he right. could be brought back, Well, I believe. Could, because they didn't charge him with that. And by the same token, Gary could be charged with murder if they found a body. Oh, absolutely. And that so, would probably yeah. be a slam dunk. I mean, the, the fact that Richard had been acquitted of kidnapping no mention of murder in those charges, so... And Gary had been convicted in 1995. Then we go all the way to 2013, when a woman named Tanya Priest called Greg Oaks, the Oswego County DA, to tell him about a conversation she'd had back in 2006 at her friend Victoria West's home. So this Tanya said that in the spring of 2006, she was dropping off Victoria after work and she went inside Victoria's trailer, which she shared with her boyfriend, James Steen, whose uh, nickname was Thumper. She and Victoria went into the living room and sat on a couch while Thumper was sitting in the recliner eating a plate of scrambled eggs and toast. So they're sitting in the living room, and the story comes on the TV about Heidi Allen's disappearance. Victoria and Tanya were talking with each other about Heidi's case, and one of them said, 
well, geez, if Thibodeau didn't do it, then who did? An old thumper sitting there in the recliner, taking it easy, gobbling the eggs. He heard the conversation, and he asked if they really wanted to know what happened to Heidi. Thumper then said that he and two friends named Roger Breckenridge and Michael Borer drove Michael Borer's white van to the store, pulled up to the store, Thumper went in a side door, Roger went in the front door to distract Heidi. Thumper said he grabbed her from behind the counter. Michael stayed in the van. Thumper said that once he grabbed her, Roger helped him take her out the side door. When they got outside, the doors of the van were open. Thumper described bear-hugging her and slamming her into the van. He said that they all jumped into the van and flew out of there like a bat out of hell. So this is interesting. No security cameras in the store. No. That hardly ever happens anymore. This is a time time of more innocence. I guess, but gee, it would have helped, wouldn't it? It would have. The other thing is that this is a pretty small community. Things like video surveillance would probably not be appearing for a while. Well, it didn't, but it's a shame, really. Yeah, well, it certainly would have helped, as you said. (laughs) Yeah. So Tanya said that Thumper was laughing about all this. Thumper said they took Heidi directly to Roger's house and took her into the back of the garage. Thumper said that Jennifer Westcott was there, too, and she was upset with them for bringing her there. Well, Tanya would say that she and Victoria didn't believe Thumper at the time, and she had said, yeah, right, how did you kill her? And he said that the three of them took turns beating the shit out of her. That's a quote. They asked him why he would do something like that, because according to Tanya... She'd always thought of Thumper as kind of a gentleman. And he said that her boyfriend owed drug money and that the person he owed money to was calling and threatening him. Heidi had tried to help and told the person that she was going to report him to the investigators. So Thumper claimed that if Heidi did get the chance to report him, that some big, big guys were going down. I guess meaning some higher-up drug dealers is the way I take that. Right. And Thumper said they couldn't let that happen. So Victoria and Tanya, according to Tanya, still didn't believe him. They thought he was just being, you know, blustery. I don't know. What would you call that? Idiotic is definitely a word I'd use. Yeah, no, he blustered. Yeah. Yeah, he got pissed off. Then he became really angry and he told them if they didn't believe him, they should go and look in the garage across the street from Roger's house through the thick woods. Because he said that they dragged Heidi for a while to the point where he thought he was going to have a heart attack. And he didn't look like he was in great shape. Victoria then asked him if it was so hard, why did they do it that way? Thumper said it was the only way that they could get her there without being seen. He said if they went across the tracks until they hit another spot of thick brush, there was a small cabin back in there. He said that all three of them took Heidi into that cabin, cut her body up into pieces with a hacksaw, peeled back the floorboards, put her body under the floor, and then resealed the floor. He said that they put her clothes in the wood stove of the cabin, and he didn't say if they had burned the clothes, but he told Victoria and Tanya that they could go look in the wood stove if they didn't believe his story. Now, I don't know how believable this story is. Is it any more believable than the story that the Thibodeau brothers did it? I'm not sure. I'm really not either. I mean, part of me wants to think this guy's just bullshitting. I could see why she would think that. This whole cutting someone into pieces with a hacksaw seems pretty crazy. Yeah. And the fact that they could get away with it and reseal the floor. These weren't the sharpest tools, were they? No. These guys were on drugs and not really that together. So Victoria and Tanya still weren't believing him, and he was getting more angry. So he told them it would be his word against theirs if they went there alone, or he would take them there, but then they would be witnesses and he would kill them both. He said that Heidi's murder was the reason that Jennifer Westcott and Roger Breckenridge moved to Florida, because there were searches going on behind Roger's house. So Tanya said she got into an argument with Thumper at that point and asked him, well, then how did Gary Thibodeau get involved? He said it was only because he had a white van. They kind of lucked out that there was this other white van. And she said something like, that's nice, Thumper. Now there's an innocent man in prison and you got a dead girl down the road. She said he just shrugged his shoulders and said, oh, well, like not my problem. Tanya then told Victoria she'd had enough and she left the trailer. But she said that Victoria followed her. She didn't want to be alone with Thumper. But Tanya did leave her there. 
So we can see that Victoria did have good reason to be afraid of Thumper, and we'll get to that. Yes, we will. Within a few days, Victoria, Jen Lumley, and Jen Lumley's friend, also known as Jen, tried to search the area Thumper had told them about, but they couldn't get past the thick trees and brush. Within one week, she stopped by Victoria's house and saw that the front door had been ripped off the trailer. At that point, Tanya didn't want Victoria or Thumper anywhere near her or her kids, so she's kind of frightened of this guy. Yeah, and I think she was avoiding him, and it, it definitely seems like Victoria was in some kind of abusive relationship with the Thumper guy. Even though Tanya said she'd considered him as a gentle person, definitely doesn't seem that way. I think she was mm -hmm. wrong about him. I'm just wondering, though, how thick does the brush have to be that you can't get through it? I mean, come on. If you really suspect there's a house or a garage back there, and it's going to yield the remains of Heidi Allen. Well, I guess it depends how determined and fit you are. I guess they weren't very determined. Plus, it would depend on the time of the year when you do it. I could see if there was snow, it would be hard to get through the woods. Granted. But you're right. I think if they were determined, they would have made it through. But they gave up. So maybe they weren't totally convinced there was anything to find anyway at that point. Yeah, that's true. So Tanya said that she had been aware at the time of Heidi's disappearance that Michael Borer had a white work van. Aha. Uh -huh. Back when police were looking for a white van in connection with the case, Michael Borer showed up at friend June Shaw's house with a small black two-door truck, which he had said he had recently bought. Tanya was at June's house when Michael Borer showed up, and she asked him what had happened to his truck, and he told her, oh, I broke down. Right, referring to the van. The van. A couple years later, according to Tanya, she saw June's neighbor, John Collins, with Michael Borer's van, and he told her that he had gotten the van from Borer. So the last Tanya knew of that van, she said she saw it up on blocks in John Collins' yard. And Tanya said that back in 2006, and Tanya said that back in 2006, she just didn't believe Thumper. Then Tanya did begin to believe it. In September 2010, James Steen, a.k.a. Thumper, killed two people, and he had locked police into a seven-hour standoff in the Oswego County village of Pulaski before he did surrender. His two victims were his then-estranged wife, Victoria Steen, formerly West, which is Tanya's friend, of course, and her new boyfriend, Charles Carr Jr. So this made Tanya realize that, yeah, Thumper was capable of murder. Then in June 2011, Thumper was given life in prison without parole for shooting Victoria and Charles Carr to death with a shotgun. So this seems like a good time to take a break for our sponsors. Support for today's show comes from White Boy Rick, based on the unbelievable and shocking true story of Rick Worsha Jr. Set in 1980s Detroit at the height of the crack epidemic and the war on drugs, White Boy Rick is based on the moving true story of a blue-collar father and his teenage son, Rick Worsha Jr. Rick begins as an undercover police informant. However, he's seduced by the lure of easy money, and he becomes a drug dealer himself. And eventually, he is abandoned by his handlers and sentenced to life in prison. Starring Academy Award winner Matthew McConaughey in a career redefining role, according to IGN and Richie Merritt. Directed by Jan Dimage and written by Andy Weiss and Logan and Noah Miller. So don't miss White Boy Rick. It's rated R. It's now on digital and on Blu-ray starting December 25th. Go deeper into the story with a mini-documentary, The Unknown True Story of Rick Worsha Jr., which is included in the digital and Blu-ray extras. Yeah, I'm excited about this one, so I'm really anxious to see it. And, you know, 1980s Detroit. Now, you were a teenager then. I was a teenager. Did you hear of this kid? No, I didn't live in Detroit proper. Well, I know that, but it must have been news. Probably, but do you think I watched the news in the 80s? I was a kid. True. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that is where I grew up. That's the hood. Yeah, although you never heard of the guy, so you lose all your cred. <laughs> all my street cred is gone. Yeah. Okay. Well, check out the movie. It looks good. It does. I'm going to watch it. This podcast is brought to you by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you, backed by 24-7 protection. There are a vast number of things you can do with your secure smart home, like turndown service 
which is an ADT automation that arms your system, locks your doors, and turns down your lights and thermostat. Or worry-free getaway service, which lets you arm your system, lock up, and set lighting schedules before you leave on vacation. We used this recently when we visited our daughter and grandsons, and we really appreciated this automation. It worked great. Well, yeah, I always worry a little bit about what's going on back at the house when we're away, so this kind of set my mind at rest. Good. It worked well. Mm -hmm. And all this is controlled from the ADT app, or the sound of your voice, and is backed by 24-7 protection. Best of all, at least in my view, you don't have to worry about installing and configuring your system. ADT will do it for you. Just visit ADT.com slash smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. So Tanya moved out of state, and she said that Thumper's conviction and the tragic death of her husband, who died that same year, made her realize that she had to tell someone what she knew about the Heidi Allen case. So Tanya at this point called Greg Oakes, the county prosecutor, who was a guy that she had known back in high school. They'd grown up together. Greg had not been the DA back when Gary Thibodeau was convicted, of course, because years have passed, but he remembered the case pretty well. So the DA flew Tanya up to New York to hear more details from her story implicating three new suspects in Heidi's kidnapping. Tanya and DA Oakes discussed ways to verify her story. In the story told by Thumper back in 2006, he had told Tanya that Jennifer Westcott had been at Michael Boris' house the day that Heidi was abducted, and she knew that the three men had abducted and killed Heidi. Tanya had known Jennifer back in high school as well, so the DA told her to get in touch with Jennifer on Facebook. And after exchanging messages on Facebook, the two women exchanged telephone numbers. The DA's office wired into Tanya's phone and recorded her calls with Jennifer. Now, it had been years since they had last spoken, so of course it took some time, for Tanya to get Jennifer to open up to her. And still, she didn't say much. But she didn't deny anything, either. In a call on March 2, 2013, Jennifer began to open up a bit about what had happened to Heidi. So this is from the phone conversations. So, Tanya, did you even know that this was Heidi, and that they brought her there, and that this is what they're going to do? Jennifer, uh uh-uh. Tanya, you had no clue? They just showed up with her? Jennifer, yeah. Tanya, what a bad position for you. Probably scared the shit out of you. Jennifer, well, it's, it's not even, they, they didn't even bring her into the house. They made her sit in the van. Tanya, yeah, Thumper told me they took her out in the garage, and uh, me and Vicky at this point, honestly, Jennifer, didn't believe him. Jennifer, right. Tanya, and that he said they took her out of the, to the garage and they beat her until she died. Jennifer, uh, I didn't know about that. So we can see that Jennifer is reluctant. A little bit. Tanya's huh? trying to pull her out, yeah. So Tanya, that's what he told me, and I mean as long as that's all you know and everything, then the only thing they said you did was junk the van with Roger. And I really wouldn't worry about anything. I mean, you really had no part of it. It's kind of sad that it even happened. Is that why you guys went to Florida? Jennifer. Uh Uh-huh. Tanya. What did they do? Just leave her in the van when they got to your house? Jennifer. Yeah. Tanya. Who actually freaking killed her? Jennifer. I have no idea. It didn't happen around me. Tanya. Did you know everybody? Jennifer. It bothers me to talk about it. I won't lie to you. Tanya, oh, I know, hon, but that's why it bothers me. It's been bothering me since Thumper told me, and I was like, no way Jennifer doesn't know. She would have talked to me and Vicky about it because we were all really close. Jennifer, I couldn't say anything about that, never to anybody. No, nothing. Tanya, who scared you? Roger? Probably Roger living with you? Jennifer, yeah, yeah, it was all crazy hanging out with all them people. Tanya. What they do, threaten you if you said anything? Jennifer, no, I just didn't. They never said anything, nothing. Nothing was ever said to me in regards to it, and crazy. Tanya, did you ever think of turning Roger in for it, honey? Jennifer, nope. Tanya, scared you that bad? Jennifer, I would never open a can of worms like that. Tanya, why you hate him? He's done so much to you, you know. Jennifer, well, and I have been through enough. I don't want to deal with anything new. Tanya, 
No, I know. Can't say I blame you. Jennifer, God almighty, I'm not doing the investigator's job. I don't get paid enough. They're not going to give me a big reward. Tanya, right. Jennifer, you know, they're just going to laugh in my face. Somebody has already been convicted and blah, blah, blah. You did a good job with that. Thanks. <laughs> well, at first, Tanya had felt sorry for Jennifer, she said. But then, as you can see through this conversation, it seemed like Jennifer had no concern for what had happened to Heidi and no remorse for not speaking up. The DA's office thought that there may have been some truth to Tanya's claim after they listened to this recording. They brought Jennifer in for questioning. She said that she had not said any of the things that she had said in the conversation with Tanya. Then, after being confronted with the audio tapes of the conversation, Jennifer claimed that the things she said were simply not true. So Gary Thibodeau had been in prison for 21 years and was resigned to his fate after exhausting all of his appeals. Neither Gary nor Richard Thibodeau knew that the DA's office was actually taking another look at the case. Jennifer continued to tell investigators that she knew nothing about Heidi's abduction. She claimed that she was just trying to appease Tanya and get her off the phone. And then she would flip-flop, so she really wasn't very credible. The DA did track down James Steen, Thumper, who's in prison, of course, Roger Breckenridge, and Michael Borer, and they all denied having any knowledge of Heidi's kidnapping. Investigators also contacted the jailhouse snitches from 20-some years ago, and they stood by their testimony. The DA said he believed them because they got nothing in exchange for their testimonies. And the DA didn't find Jennifer Westcott to be a reliable witness. Then he started to question Tanya's credibility. He held it against her that she had not come forward to authorities sooner. Well, that's a big problem for me, too. Yeah. It took years. Well, it happened in 94. She heard the conversation in 2006. And she didn't go to police till five or six years later. Right. Actually, 2013. Yeah. Seven years, or just about seven years. So, yeah, that's a long time. And, and part of her reason was that she is frightened of Thumper, but he had been put away in prison in 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Yeah. So I have difficulty believing all her stuff because it took her so damn long to come forward. Yeah, and I think that's how the DA felt as well. And months went by after that, and Tanya was called and told that the case was closed, which she didn't like that. And Gary Thibodeau, they said, was their guy, and he was in prison. End of story. Tanya was very upset and felt like she was being dismissed. For her, it was upsetting, she said, that an innocent man was in prison and the real killers were free. All but Thumper, of course, who was in prison for killing Victoria and her boyfriend. So at this point, I find Tanya a little more believable because she persists. And I think if you were making it up, you might give up at that point. But she continued to make calls until she was put in touch with attorney Lisa Peebles. And Lisa was a New York public defender who had ties to the defense lawyers who had worked on Gary Thibodeau's failed appeals. Lisa listened to the recorded calls from Tanya, and she had a very different reaction than the DA did. She believed it. She called her friend John O'Brien, who was a reporter with Syracuse.com. And O'Brien was very interested. This was the first time in 20 years that anyone had said they knew anything about the kidnapping of Heidi Allen. So he got in touch with Richard Thibodeau to see if he had any information that could help him learn more about this case. Yeah, and Richard was happy to help. He was still close to his brother, and he wanted to get him exonerated and out of prison. And as it turned out, Richard had seven boxes of information gathered on the case. He had been keeping everything he could find related to the trial. So Lisa Peebles and John O'Brien went through the boxes, and they found an internal memo from the Oswego Sheriff's Office that put Heidi's case in a whole new light. Heidi had a secret arrangement with law enforcement as a confidential informant. She had an informant card with code name Julia Roberts with her name and all of her personal information. So Lisa Peebles wondered how this had not been brought up at the trial, because her informant status would open up other possible motives for her abduction. I believe it absolutely would. And it turns out her informant card was not locked away in a sheriff's office either. A deputy was carrying it around with him, 
and according to Oswego County Sheriff's Department records, a Deputy Anderson was assigned to the anti-crime team and was working part-time in an undercover capacity. While he was assigned to this patrol, he was advised by Sergeant Lordy that he had information from Judge Sturtz that his niece, Heidi Allen, had some information about drug activity involving some of the local high school students. Sergeant Lordy and Deputy Van Patten had met with Heidi at her home, and she was driven to the sheriff's office by her boyfriend, Brett, who would sit in on their meeting. And so Heidi described to police that there were several parties involving drug use and that a friend of hers was mixed up in it. So Heidi wanted to help this friend. Heidi told them that she did not use drugs and she didn't have a way to buy drugs firsthand. She had only seen the activity. So she was formally signed up as a confidential informant, but the case was left inactive. Now, during an interview with sheriff's investigators, Heidi's aunt revealed more about her informant status, including information her aunt had said had been kept hidden. So her aunt, Martha Sturtz, met with Oswego County Sheriff's investigators, and in a recorded interview, Martha said that Heidi, who at that time was 15 years old, had been babysitting her cousin's child in the early 1990s, and Heidi was often babysitting late into the night. Yes, she said Heidi got so she was staying there instead of coming home, and she got in with the whole group. My sister got called to Pleasant Point for a party they had there, and it was a booze party, Martha said. When police arrived at the Point Pleasant house, they had contacted Heidi's mom. Heidi's mother got called because Heidi was only 15, and she had the baby that she had been babysitting in the car asleep. Martha told investigators there was tension between Heidi and her parents, which led to a person in need of supervision petition for her, also known as a PINS petition. But none of this concerned drug use or drug selling. So to me, it doesn't seem that police would have anything much on Heidi to coax her into being an informant. Doesn't seem to be. And having that baby in the car. I mean, maybe she was protecting the baby in that way, having the baby out in the car with her. I'm not sure. I would absolutely look at it that way, that she knew what was going on in the house. And she didn't want to have the baby around there. Sounds like it. So when they took Heidi to the police station back then, a picture of her was taken, and a 3 by 5 card was completed with her address and her other personal information. At an unknown time, Deputy Van Patten had used the outdoor phone at the D&W store where Heidi worked, and he unknowingly dropped the index card and the picture of Heidi that went with it. While he was off duty... Deputy Van Patten was called by a Deputy Montgomery, who told him that Heidi's informant card and photo had been turned over to him by another D&W employee. So Van Patten advised Montgomery to place the items in his work mailbox. And Van Patten would say that he never did use Heidi as an informant. But we don't know how long that card and photo were sitting out there, or who else had seen it. That's true. We don't. And members of Heidi's family denied that Heidi was ever a confidential informant. Another aunt, Nancy Searles, from the other side of the family, said that Heidi had talked to sheriff's investigators when she was about 16, and it was about a friend's drug use because she was concerned about her friend and wanted to get help for her. When rumors began circulating about Heidi being an informant, Nancy Searles said that she didn't believe the sheriff's department would use a teenager as an informant. Heidi was not interested in being an informant, and I think there would be something amiss about police asking a young person to put themselves at what could be great risk, Searles told Syracuse.com in late 1994. But we know that police do use teens as undercover informants. That they do. Now, usually this is a kid who's been arrested for a minor drug offense, like possession of marijuana or something like that. But the police will tell the kid that you're facing big jail time unless you do this for us. And that's how they turn them into confidential informants. It's almost a little bit of a sting type of thing. Yeah, but that's so dangerous. So, so that's, that's how it is. I mean, typically a teen who's a confidential informant is someone who's worried about being arrested. Yes, but yeah. there's no sign of that with Heidi's story. No. The other thing with using teens, they're not trained for anything. I mean, it's it's basically, you look out for these things for us and we'll drop the charges against you, that type of thing, sort of a quid pro quo. 
but it could be dangerous. And there's been a number of cases where the teenage confidential informant has been killed by drug dealers. Sure, I could see that. And teenagers aren't the greatest at keeping secrets anyway. No, they she aren't. could have told one of her girlfriends, and it could have, you know, everyone could have known in the group. Well, and I, I just think there's a whole bunch of ethical considerations about using teens as confidential informants. Well, I could even expand that to using anyone. So we, we don't have any evidence that Heidi herself was involved in drugs, just that she was concerned about friends who might be. The other thing I'm thinking, and, and I don't know, maybe it's a little naive, but the population of New Haven, New York, in 2010 was a little over 2,000. Oh, so everybody knows everything there. I mean, there. it's a tiny little town, and even these towns around there are all tiny little towns. Do you need a confidential informant? Yeah, I don't know. Good question. But these, these are just tiny little burgs. But there was a drug problem in that town. There were a lot of people on drugs. Sure, but I don't think you need a CI to help <laughs> ferret them out. No, they it's, didn't seem like they were that bright. It's a small enough town you can figure out who's using and who's not. True. I mean, you can just have a policeman go undercover, right? That's what they're for. Sure. And if it's got to be a teenager, pick a young-looking cop. Exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, when, where did 21 Jump Street come from, right? <laughs> I, I think we're probably oversimplifying things, but that's I'm just not really enthused about teenagers in particular being a confidential informant. Well, no. And even if Heidi was not directly involved with someone getting arrested, we have to agree that being an informant would have put her in danger. Absolutely. And having that card lying there out in the parking lot was not great either. Rather stupid. Yes. And even when they found it and returned it, it was just like, I just put it in my mailbox. I know, right? Jeez. So what was important for Lisa Peebles about Heidi's confidential informant card was that it had been given to Richard Thibodeau's defense attorney, but not to Gary Thibodeau's defense attorney. And Gary's the one who was convicted. We know that prosecutors are required to turn over any evidence that might help the defense, and the failure to do so is a Brady violation. Lisa Peebles filed a motion to have Gary's conviction thrown out based on this. John O'Brien began writing about the case on Syracuse.com, and he started getting numerous tips and leads. He interviewed one of the jailhouse informants who had ratted on Gary. His name was Robert Baldessoro, and he recorded the interview. Baltasoro's testimony had changed. He said that Gary Thibodeau had never come straight out and said that he killed anyone. A co-worker of Heidi's said in a sworn statement that before Heidi went missing, she had been afraid because the sheriff's office wanted her to nail people for selling cocaine. So that's disturbing. It sure is. So the judge who looked at this new evidence decided to hold a hearing. This occurred in January 2015. The hearing was held in the case of Gary Thibodeau. Richard was there to support his brother. He was hopeful because it sounded like there was some, enough new information that maybe the conviction would be overthrown or maybe a retrial. Heidi's family was at the hearing as well, but they didn't think anything would change. They trusted the conviction by the prosecutor's office. Well, Gary's attorneys held that the prosecution had failed to turn over evidence that would have caused reasonable doubt and that his conviction should be overturned. The main item of concern was Heidi's informant status, but there were actually other issues that we were able to uncover when we read through the complete motion. So let's read over some of these statements. They're not too long, and they're fascinating. They're very interesting. We'll just go through a few of these. So the first one we have is from Darlene Upcraft. Her statement is that she had been driving to the Sunrise Service in New Haven around 6.35 in the morning, drove past the D&W convenience store. She noticed that the store was open and was surprised. When I looked over, I saw a white, very rusty van. It did not have any black on it, and the front of the van was facing the front door of the store. I figured my son would want to stop on the way back for a Mountain Dew. We left church at approximately 7.30 in the morning. We drove past the D&W. I did not notice anything. We never stopped. Later that morning, I learned Heidi Allen was missing from the store, and there was a command center set up at the fire barn. A couple days later, I made a statement to the police that I saw a white, rusty van parked perpendicular to the store on my way to church. Several days later, 
I received a call from a law enforcement officer who asked me to clarify what I saw in regard to the white van. Before I had a chance to call the officer back, a deputy came to my house and asked me if it was a black and white van. I told him it was white, rusty, no black. He asked me if I was sure it wasn't black and white, and I told him it did not have any black on it. After I saw the Thibodeau van, I understood why they kept asking me if the van was black and white. But the Thibodeau van was not the van I saw. I don't recall ever being asked to sign a statement. So this is significant. So she's saying the van she saw was not that van. Right. And then even though she gave the sheriff's department this detailed information, this information was intentionally withheld from the defense, which is a violation of the Brady law. So this woman never testified, and her statement was never taken and given to the defense. Right. Okay. And the next one I found was by Tracy Breckenridge. So that is the wife of Roger Breckenridge. And Tracy wrote, At the time Heidi Allen disappeared in 1994, I was married to Roger Breckenridge, and we lived together on Kenyon Road, not far from Gary Thibodeau. Roger left our house that Easter morning, though I'm not sure about the time, it could have been between 8 and 9. He went to his brother's house in Parrish for coffee. He returned later that day for supper. I recall the conversation between Roger and Thumper during which Roger said he didn't want anything to do with the van. At some point during or after their conversation, I left the house, and when I returned home, Roger was gone. And I thought, oh God, did he go with Thumper to get rid of the van? Roger and I separated sometime in 1994, after Heidi Allen disappeared. Roger did go to Florida with Jen, but I do not recall when they went. Every time I turned around, I was getting pulled over, and I was repeatedly asked to provide more information about the Heidi Allen case. And I was fed up with Donald Dodd. I gave him a written statement 20 years ago, and I recently gave another statement to investigators. They were out at our house so many times, it was unreal. So what do you think of that one? See, that's some other interesting information, isn't it? Yeah. Then I have Linda McKee. So Linda said, I was recently contacted by a friend of mine who I told a month ago or so about a man telling my husband and I that he drove crushed vehicles to Canada and he was sure Heidi Allen was in one of those loads. My friend directed me to the recent media accounts about a van used in the abduction of Heidi Allen being crushed and shipped to Canada. I was alarmed and very upset because neither my husband nor I said anything to police because we did not know whether to believe him. These statements were made by Ed Lewis, an individual we met in 2006, and we started socializing with him regularly for about a year. He told us that he worked for Richard Murtaugh, driving crushed vehicles. I do not know whether he worked full-time for Murtaugh or periodically because we never asked him. On approximately five occasions, he specifically told us that he drove a load of crushed cars to Canada, and he was sure Heidi Allen was in one of those cars. He was very serious when he made these statements to my husband and I, and now I feel terrible that we never said anything. And her husband Clifford says basically the same stuff. He says, my wife and I recently heard about new evidence surfacing in the Heidi Allen case, and we were concerned when we realized there is information that a van used in the abduction of Heidi Allen may have been crushed and sent to Canada. This information was consistent with admissions made by a man we befriended several years ago. These statements were made by Ed Lewis, an individual we met in 2006, and we started socializing with him regularly for about a year. He told us that he worked for Richard Murtaugh driving crushed vehicles. We do not know whether he worked full-time for Murtaugh or periodically because we never asked him. On approximately five occasions, he specifically told us that he drove a load of crushed cars to Canada and he was sure Heidi Allen was in one of those cars. He was very serious when he made these statements to my wife and I, and we feel terrible that we have never said anything. Okay, so he and his wife do say about the same thing. And I don't know if these things are true, but I definitely think they should have been followed up. They should have been given to the defense and followed up on, and not just ignored. But these are things that come out way after the trial. Yes, though that's what I mean. They should have come out sooner, before the trial. Yeah. Yeah. So Amanda Braley 
said, Between 2000 and 2006, I hung out with, among others, Jennifer Westcott, James Steen, a.k.a. Thumper, Roger Breckenridge, and Tanya Priest. There were multiple conversations between Steen, Breckenridge, and Westcott when they discussed scrapping the van used in the abduction of Heidi Allen. I specifically recall admissions made by Steen and Breckenridge regarding the crushing of the van at Murtaugh's junkyard and then transporting it to Canada. I heard them say her body was still in the van and she would never be found. I remember Jen Westcott laughing about it when they would make these statements, and I heard Jen talking about driving the van to Murtaugh's. In 2003, there were five or six people, including myself, and we were standing on the backside deck of Jennifer Westcott's parents' house. We were just hanging out, having a conversation. Although I do not recall how, the topic of Heidi Allen came up. Someone mentioned her name, and Jen and Roger just laughed. Roger then stated, We took that bitch to the scrapyard in the van, had it crushed, and she was shipped to Canada. She's long gone now. He swung his hand up and pointed his finger in the northern direction of the sky and said, See ya, bye. He laughed and Jen slapped him on the shoulder and said, Roger, you can't be saying that shit. He responded with what, Jen? That shit is done and over with, and besides, nobody is ever going to find her. Roger proceeded to laugh and Jen shook her head and rolled her eyes and said, Whatever, Roger. Sometime in 2006, Tanya Priest asked me to walk with her into the woods to try and find a cabin where she said Steen had told her Heidi was buried, but we never found a cabin there or any of Heidi Allen's remains. So they they did search. That's what she said, yeah. And she said she never came forward because she feared for her safety, and she always believed their claims and admissions. So she did believe it from the beginning, she's claiming. Okay, but that's a different story from what they had been told by Thumper about carrying her body across the street into a cabin in the woods and pulling up the floorboards after dismembering her. Right, exactly. So now we have, no, we didn't do that. We kept her in the van. We took the van to the junkyard and had it crushed. Yeah, but what's all this talk about, right? Because if they didn't do it, would they really be saying all this? Are they that idiotic? They could be. Who knows? And who jokes about something so horrible? So I have another statement from Megan Shaw. And Megan said, around the month of March, April or May 2010, James Steen was at my house on Dutch Hill Road. My husband, Sidney Shaw, and I were sitting in the living room when James came over. I know James was drugged up when he came over. He was on a rampage about his wife, Vicky, and how he was going to kill her. I sat there and laughed at him and said, no, you wouldn't kill Vicky. You wouldn't do that. But that's when James started talking about Heidi Allen. James said, you want to make a bet? I helped dispose of Heidi Allen. He said Heidi was trying to get her boyfriend out of the gang called Vicious Circle and trying to get people in trouble that were in this gang. So one night she was taken from her work by members of the gang. James said they killed her and he helped dispose of her body in a cabin in the woods across from the new storage units on Crosby Road. The next day I called Tanya Priest and told her what James had told me and she had an actual panic attack on the phone and said that is the same story James told Sydney. Tanya's ex-husband, and Megan's current husband, and her years ago. A few weeks later, James was picking up his vehicle from my house, and again he said he was going to kill Vicky. I told him, no you won't, you're just pissed off. And James said, I already told you about Heidi. I killed Heidi, I will kill Vicky. Then the final statement that I have is from Elizabeth Head, and she was a juror. She says, I sat as juror number three in the Gary Thibodeau trial in 1995, and after sending out 15 notes and deliberating for about four hours, we returned a verdict of guilty for a first-degree kidnapping of Heidi Allen. I have always been bothered by our decision because we were never certain he was guilty, and there wasn't much to go on because there was no hard evidence. We kind of felt like there had to be something or they wouldn't have gotten that far. Recently, I learned about several potential suspects who may have been the actual perpetrators of Heidi Allen's abduction. And I am haunted by the thought we may have been responsible for sending an innocent man to prison. I am very upset to learn that we were not provided all of the facts during the trial, in particular the fact that Heidi was a drug informant, and that the deputy dropped an index card to closing that fact that she was an informant. 
and this would have been critical during our deliberations. This information alone would have definitely widened the scope of possible suspects and made a difference in my decision. After listening to the phone conversation between Tanya Priest and Jennifer Westcott, I was more convinced that Gary Thibodeau was wrongly convicted, and I believe he should be released immediately. So this statement by a juror was submitted because it relates to whether the evidence establishes a reasonable doubt. But the defense did recognize that statements by jurors may not be used to impeach a verdict once the jury's already been discharged. So the affidavit was only brought forward to show that there was a possibility that it would have changed the result. But you can't just be a juror and change your mind, of course. It doesn't well, work that way. No, it doesn't work that way. And if, if she had so many doubts, why did she vote guilty? Well, what she said was is that she felt, well, they wouldn't have brought it to trial unless they had good reason, pretty yeah. much. Well, see, and that gets back to what I said earlier. Exactly really, what you said, that, yeah. Uh, they're, they're thinking that the defendant's guilty, so they're going to convict him. That's why if I ever get put on trial for murder or anything serious, I'm going to ask for a bench trial. Because with a jury, you just never know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates. That's right. So we've got statements by Tracy Breckenridge, the McKees, and Amanda Braley, which seem to corroborate information in the police-recorded conversations between Tanya Priest and Jennifer Westcott. In follow-up conversations, Jennifer admitted to helping Roger Breckenridge jump the van used to abduct Heidi Allen. Yeah, I just think at that point, her word wasn't very valuable anymore. No, I think it just sucks at that point. Yeah. So in March 2013, Jennifer Westcott admitted sending a text message to Richard Murtaugh, the owner of the junkyard, immediately before she went in for her police interview. Now, this is significant because Tanya Priest never mentioned where the van was junked during the recorded phone conversations. So Westcott was for some reason compelled to send the text before being questioned by investigator Piotrowski. And it wasn't until Piotrowski asked for her consent to go through her phone that Westcott stated, whatever, because I even texted Rich Murtaugh today about it because supposedly Tanya said the van was junked there. So I asked Rich Murtaugh, did Thumper have anything to do with messing with Heidi Allen? Tanya had never mentioned Murtaugh to Westcott, so her information regarding the van being junked came only from Jennifer Westcott. That makes me think there's something to it. One would think. Yeah. However. Well, in 2014, Thumper gave a police statement denying that he had anything to do with Heidi Allen's abduction. He also wrote a letter to John O'Brien, the reporter, telling him to stop printing lies, and he also called Tanya an immature bitch. And let me just tell you, his spelling is not great. <laughs> really? <laughs> really. That's a surprise. <laughs> The prosecutor's office argued that they did give the informant information to Gary Thibodeau's defense team. They also claimed that her informant status didn't matter. It was irrelevant because she never really worked for the police on a case. So if Heidi hadn't been naming names to police, they argued that she was not in jeopardy. The sheriff's office denied that her ID card being lost in the store parking lot put her in danger. To me, that's ridiculous. It of is. course it did. And now that you've told me the small population, one person seeing that, it's going to get to 10% of the population by nightfall. You're right. So in addition, well-known FBI profiler Clint Van Zant did not believe that either of the Thibodeau brothers fit the profile of the person who had kidnapped Heidi. He described the profile of a man who would be stalkerish and obsessed with Heidi's case. He also suggested that the perpetrator would have a history of stalking or physical abuse of women. Now, interestingly, Michael Bohr, one of the three men at Jennifer Westcott's house the day of Heidi's abduction, seemed to fit the profile. He lived less than a mile from the convenience store, and he had Heidi make him a sandwich most mornings. And Bohr was obsessed with Heidi's case. He told investigators that he was preoccupied with the case and thought, about her at least six times a day. He had a shoebox full of newspaper clippings on the case. He cried when he was interrogated about the case, and he also admitted that he had been a drug dealer back in 1994. So to me, that's something. That's more than something. 
And I don't believe that was brought up either during Gary's trial. Of course, a lot of that they didn't know. They didn't. But still, that would be significant to a jury. Then there was Catherine Schmidt. This woman contacted Lisa Peebles and said that she was attacked by Michael Bohr years before Heidi was abducted. She said that he had her in a chokehold and was dragging her trying to get her into his car, but she managed to run away with only minor injuries. And Bohr pled guilty to unlawful imprisonment, and he did go to jail for that. But the judge wouldn't allow the testimony of Catherine Schmidt, ruling her story not relevant. After the hearing, months passed before a decision was published. And I think that Gary Thibodeau got his hopes up over those months. You know, he'd kind of been defeated and accepted his fate, but I think once they had the hearing, he had his hopes up. That's the impression I got from interviews with him. Yeah, it seemed like he, you know, the initial stuff was that he was in prison for those 20-some years and was just resigned to the fact that he's going to stay in prison. Sure. But then this stuff started coming out, and he, he got a little bit of hope. Well, because he was still close to Richard, he had a lot of family support still. So I could see that. So it took months before they came back with a ruling. Yeah, and the judge ruled that the DA had not committed a Brady violation, saying that there was no proof that they had not handed over Heidi's informant documents, and additional testimony would not have made a difference in the jury's decision. As for alternative suspects, the judge said it was all speculation and hearsay. So I could see maybe they couldn't prove that the defense didn't get those documents, but they didn't use them. We know they didn't use them in his defense. So why couldn't he have said that he had ineffective counsel for not using that? I wonder if because his appeals were used up, that wasn't possible. Maybe one of our attorney listeners could let us know about that. Yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of different stories going on, though. Absolutely. So maybe it was... Uh you know, just being unable to decide which one was the most truthful. So none of the three, Breckenridge, Bohr, and Thumper, none of them have been charged with anything related to Heidi's case. And Heidi has never been found. In August 2018, this year, Gary Thibodeau died in prison. He was on hospice care in the hospital ward. So he did spend his life in prison. Yes, he did. Which if he didn't do it, that's awful. So if you want to find out more about this case, there is a Dateline episode called The Informant. And it was kind of hard to find, so I'm going to put the link in our show notes. There's also a book you can read by Heidi's sister, Lisa Busk. It's called Where's Heidi? One Sister's Journey. Which is not really about the case. It's more about how she dealt with losing her sister and her life afterwards. This podcast was sponsored by ADT. ADT can design and install a smart home just for you, backed by 24-7 protection. Like, turn down service and ADT automation that arms your system, locks your doors, and turns down your lights and thermostat. Or, worry-free getaway service, which lets you arm your system, lock up, and set lighting schedules before you go on vacation. All are controlled from the ADT app or the sound of your voice and backed by 24-7 protection. Just visit ADT.com slash smart to learn more about how ADT can design and install a secure smart home just for you. The music for True Crime Brewery is written and produced by Tristan Capel. If you want more TCB in your life, you can go to our website, tiegrabber.com, and join Team Tiegrabber for access to members-only episodes. Along with this exclusive access to our large bank of members-only episodes, You'll receive a gift from us as well as our undying affection. You can also go to Patreon and become a patron of True Crime Brewery and get the same benefits. In November, we covered the murders at White House Farm, and other members-only episodes include the case of child killer Diane Downs, our O.J. Simpson series, the case of Robert Fisher, whose entire family was found murdered and who is still missing, and there are about 15 or 20 more episodes. For a special Christmas edition on the members-only feed, we'll be watching and podcasting about one of our favorite Christmas love stories called The Family Man, and it stars Tia Leone and Nicolas Cage. We thought that this would be a fun little break from crime to have a bit of lightheartedness. 
Some other ways for you to show your support for True Crime Brewery are following us on Twitter at Tigrebber Pods, on Instagram, Tigrebber Podcasts, and on Facebook. You can also join our True Crime Brewery fan discussions group on Facebook and get into some conversations about past cases or all kinds of crime topics. If you enjoy our show, please take a minute to give us a review on iTunes or wherever you listen because that helps us in finding new listeners. So we'll move on to feedback now. Just remember you can send feedback and case suggestions to us in an email to truecrimebrewery at tigrebber.com or you can tell us in your own voice by leaving a voicemail on the Leave a Voicemail link on the front page of our website, tigrebber.com. If you submit a voicemail before the end of the year, and if we play it on an episode, we're going to send you an absolutely free TCB t-shirt. One last note, if you click on Shop the Brewery at tigrebber.com, you'll see that we now have a link to our Tee Public store, where you can get TCB logos on everything from hoodies to cell phone cases. And there are a few different designs now. A few different designs and a much bigger selection. Yeah. We're very happy with it. I know. That's where I'm getting my Christmas gifts. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go ahead with feedback. Let's start with the voicemails. Who's our first voicemail? We have three voicemails. The first one is Rebecca. Okay. Let's hear what Rebecca had to say. Hi, Dick and Jill. I'm leaving a message with both a comment about a recent episode and two suggestions for future cases. Um, So first off, I love your podcast. I've been listening for a long time. I really like the unique dynamic you two have. Um, This last episode, however, about the Winesville farm murders uh, was really just over the top. It was some really graphic nightmare stuff. um, And I noticed you didn't give any content warnings beforehand. Uh, At least I didn't catch one. Um, And I don't know what your opinions are on trigger content warnings, but I just thought I'd give my thoughts in case it sways your or anyone's um, listening opinion. Uh, I know trigger warnings get a bad rap with people thinking that those who need trigger warnings are just being too sensitive. Um, But, you know, I've come to learn that triggering content warnings can be a really useful aid to someone going through cognitive behavioral therapy for anxiety and PTSD. Um, Before I started doing cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, um, I would just avoid any situation or any conversation that caused me to panic. Uh, And I would just shut down, go into flight or fight mode. But after working with my therapist uh, through coping mechanisms that I could use in those situations, um, I found that I could expose myself more gradually, especially if there was a heads up. Um, In my case, an example is any like mention or discussion of suicide Um, and before CBT, I just couldn't talk about the anxiety or the panic that I was experiencing. I would just get defensive, angry, and shut down. Um, and my therapist gave me another example of vets who often, you know, really need content or trigger warnings if they're going through, if they're experiencing PTSD or working through similar panic issues. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, like I said, I know trigger warnings get a lot of flack, but I think that maybe if people knew they're not used to avoid situations, but really so that people can sort of ready um, the coping mechanisms that they are working on um, so they're not caught off guard. Okay, so I know this is long, but I also have a case suggestion. I have two case suggestions. One is the Harvey um, family murders that took place in Richmond, Maryland. Um, It's a really sad case where a family was killed on New Year's Day. There are some interesting details. Um, One of the daughters was actually dropped off at the house by a neighbor during the situation. Um, The murderer, Ricky Gray, um, ended up murdering his girlfriend and her family a few days later. And the woman who was murdered was a sister of an actor on Desperate Housewives. Um, The murderer had a really messed up childhood that they tried to use in court as part of his defense. Uh, So it's just a lot there. It's pretty wild. And the other one was, I'd love to hear your take on the Irving, Texas murders of the daughters of Yabir Abdel Said, who's been on the FBI Most Wanted list for, I think, 10 years. Um, So thanks. Sorry so long. And love your podcast. Okay. Well, thank you, Rebecca. Now, we do have a warning just to address that first at the beginning of our podcast, but it's not specific. Right. But in the case of the Wineville chicken farm murders... We did say that there were graphic details and that we were going to leave out most of them. We did omit most of them, yeah. And we did get some flack from some people saying that we shouldn't cut out the details. Right. So So, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Yeah, it's hard to please everyone, but it's definitely something I would consider. But that is why we did put the warning at the beginning, the general warning about what the podcast is about. Right. Okay. So what about these cases? 
Well, let me talk about the second one first, the Abdel Sayed case we're going to be talking about in another voicemail from another listener. Oh, okay. So, so we'll cover that then. The other one, the Harvey family murders, this is a 2006 Richmond, Virginia spree murders, took place over a seven-day period. Seven people, including four members of the Harvey family and three members of the Baskerville-Tucker family, were killed. The perpetrators were Ricky Javon Gray and his nephew Ray Joseph Dandridge. Dandridge's girlfriend, Ashley Baskerville, assisted the pair as an accomplice during their murder and robbery spree until she became one of their victims. After Gray and Dandridge were arrested, two prior murders, including that of Gray's wife and a near-fatal assault in late 2005, were linked to the men. So Dandridge pleaded guilty to murdering the three Baskerville Tucker victims in exchange for receiving a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Gray was charged with capital murder in connection with the Harvey family killings, convicted and sentenced to death, and he was executed by lethal injection January 18, 2017. So we will look into those. Okay. All right, let's move on to our next voicemail from Phoebe. Hi, Jill and Jake. This is Phoebe. I have one case suggestion for you. Uh, Yasser Abdul said he's a fugitive on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Uh, He's an Egyptian resident of the United States who's wanted for the murder of his two teenage daughters in Irving, Texas. From what I've read, he was married an American woman, even though he was still very much committed to his Muslim faith and traditions. The marriage was very tumultuous and abusive, both physically and emotionally. His wife, Patricia Owens, left many times, but always went back, very much to the dismay of their two daughters especially. He had planned on taking his girls, um, they were named Sarah and Amina, to Egypt to marry them off to much older men, which of course they weren't big fans of. Um, Amina especially, she had fallen in love with a boy her age in Texas. Reading uh, Amina's social media posts before her death and then watching interviews with a uh, her boyfriend and his family are just chilling and heartbreaking. So I'm really surprised that no other podcast has ever covered this case. Now, uh, I also looked up a beer recommendation for you from Texas. Since it's that time of year, if you can get your hands on Shiner Holiday Cheer, which is brewed in Shiner, Texas, um, it's very Texas, you might say, strong on the peaches and pecans. It's really tasty. But if not, um, Blue Owl, From Austin, Texas, they brew some amazing sours, which are mine and Jill's favorites. All right, guys, keep on doing what you're doing, and see you in the quiet end. Girl after your own heart. Phoebe is my sister from another mister. She is. Because she's a sour girl. And her other suggestion was the Shiner Holiday Cheer. Yeah, have you had that? Which I have had. I've had a lot of Shiner beers from times when we visited our daughter in Houston. Yeah. When, when she lived in Houston. Mm-hmm. And in fact, there is a six pack sitting in my fridge right now. Awesome. In the beer fridge. So So that was a good suggestion. It was. And what about her case? Well, her case is interesting uh, for a couple things. So Yasser Abdel Sayed is a fugitive on the FBI 10 most wanted list. He's an Egyptian resident of the U.S. and is wanted for the murder of his two teenage daughters in Irving, Texas. Gee, that's just really horrific, huh? A father killing his daughters? He seemed to have believed that his daughters, Amina, age 18, and Sarah, age 17, had dishonored the family by refusing to adhere to traditional standards of Egyptian cultural behavior. So it's sort of an honor killing. We've heard from quite a few people on these types of killings recently. On January 1st, 2008, he lured them into his taxi cab on the pretense of taking them out to eat and he shot them in the cab. Holy shit. So this was very premeditated. He didn't just lose his temper. No. Wow. Premeditated. Oh, my God. And to this point, he has evaded police capture, and he's at large. So what about the girl's mother? Her life is ruined. Yeah. And she wasn't in on it at all, right? No, she wasn't. Oh, that's horrific. Isn't it? So I, I'm going to look into that. Yeah. Wow. Okay, and our next voicemail is actually from a male person, which is unusual, Norman. So let's listen to that. Hi, Jill and Dick. This is Norman from Pennsylvania calling to say hey. 
let you know I'm a big fan of the show. I have a case suggestion for you that I will be surprised if you've not heard of. Um, I used to live outside of Allentown and in a hotel not that far from my house, a professional wrestler by the name of Jimmy Snuka is alleged to have beat his girlfriend to death. Um, the story spans across a couple decades until he would sit in front of a grand jury to determine whether or not he would go to trial for the crime. Um, it's fairly famous, but I have not heard it covered on that many podcasts, so I thought it might be something that you guys would be interested in checking out. If you do decide to look at that case, I recommend that you try any beer from Weyerbacher Brewery. They're in eastern Pennsylvania. They're in the Lehigh Valley, and everything they make is excellent. I have never tried a Weyerbacher beer that I did not love. So, again, just wanted to say hello, love the show, and check out the Jimmy Snooker case if you're so inclined. I think it might make for a really interesting episode. Keep up the great work. I'll continue to listen. Thanks, Norman. Yes, thank you. So, as soon as you heard this voicemail, you came to me. This case does interest you significantly. It does. James Ryher Snuka, born James Wiley Smith, was better known by his ring name, Jimmy Superfly Snuka. And he was a Fijian professional wrestler and actor. So he wrestled for several promotions from the 70s to the 2010s. And he was best known for his time in the World Wrestling Federation which used to be WWF and is now WWE, in the early to mid-80s, and he was credited with introducing the high-flying style of wrestling to the WWF. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame, the WWF Hall of Fame, in 1996. So when he was the initial ECW heavyweight champion, which was the Eastern Championship Wrestling, he held this title twice, and his children, Jimmy Ryer Jr. and Tamina Snuka, are also wrestlers. Now, where he got into trouble, he was indicted and arrested in September 2015 for third-degree murder and involuntary manslaughter in relation to the May 1983 death of his girlfriend, Nancy Argentino. Now, he pleaded not guilty, but was ultimately found unfit to stand trial in June 2016 due to being diagnosed with dementia. Wow, how old was he? Do we know? He must have been... He was... Well, he started um, in the 70s, so he wasn't young. Well, he was born in 43, so this is uh, 70. Yeah, so he, he was, was 70. Oh, okay. Right? Yep. Did I add right? Well, it's about there. He was yeah. an older guy. Yeah. Yep. So he was diagnosed with dementia. His health declined, and the charges actually were dismissed in January of 2017, and shortly after, Jimmy died. Wow. Of natural causes. So because he was older, we can't blame this dementia on the wrestling, or can we? Oh, we probably can contribute some of it anyway. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he was an older gentleman, so maybe not entirely wrestling provoked, but it probably had something to do with it. Okay, well, that's interesting. And you said that Norman sent you some research, so he did part of our job for us, right? He did. (laughs) And he also gave us the Weyerbacher Brewing Company suggestion. Oh, yeah. How about that? Have you had those beers? Many. And they're good? They're good. They're more than good. And actually, on one of the episodes we did, we reviewed the Sunday Morning Stout by Weyerbacher, which is one of my favorites. All right. Well, Phoebe, Rebecca, and Norman, please send us an email with your address and your preferred shirt size, because you're getting a t-shirt. I think we got a couple of them already. Oh, okay. So. Oh, that's right. You let people know. Yeah, so look in your pile of addresses and shirt sizes. You're just like so totally on top of things with the feedback. I can't get over it. (laughs) It's great. Okay, so we do have some emails as well. We have two emails. One's a really long one that I'm going to let you handle. Okay. And the other one is a comment by Richard. All right, so why don't you go ahead and read Richard's comments since you're a Richard as well. Richard says, Dick and Jill, you have a a great podcast. Not a great body? No. (laughs) Dick and Jill, you have a great podcast. Thank you. However, Dick, in the Gypsy Rose case, I think you really need to take another look at your defense of the medical profession. As your wife said, these are highly educated people. There is no excuse for the medical profession not catching this for years. 
I was saddened by your opinion here, which highly defended the physicians, with the exception of the neurologist. If any of these physicians made a little effort, this would have been caught years earlier. Jill, thank you for pushing this issue on the podcast, and you wonder why there was a Dr. Death. Basically, with Dr. Death, there was only one doctor who tried to do the right thing. I am someone who really cares about the medical profession, and if I didn't care, I certainly would not have written you. Please keep up your incredible podcasts. All right. Well, thank you, Richard. Dr. Death is a podcast that I mean to, uh, I keep meaning to listen to. I haven't had a chance yet. I did read about it, though. It looks interesting. Yeah, he was responsible for a whole bunch of deaths. And this is another case where people just pushed it along, which we've seen with our cases about nurses who kill as well. Right. So what do you have to say for yourself? Well, just a couple of things. I don't think I'm trying to defend the medical profession specifically. But first of all, Munchausen by proxy is pretty rare. Most doctors are never going to see a case. So there's not a huge amount of suspicion necessarily. And then when you see a kid with chronic illnesses, Munchausen is not the first thing that jumps into your mind. Sure. And very often you're taking a history. You might not have medical records yet. So you take a history from the caretaker or the child or both, and there might not be any evidence that make you suspicious in those. And even when you get the records, unless there's something really glaring in those, you might not have a suspicion. Oh, but I think her records were glaring. Or maybe we just need to change the way that it's handled because there were so many holes in it. There are. And the other thing is they really do doctor shop. Yes, so, well, that's what I mean about maybe we need to fix that. So you, can, so you can't do that without your records going immediately yeah. to the next doctor. Well, we need a, like a central system or exactly, something. Exactly, yeah. But you can, you can get records from a physician that don't look too damning, and the perpetrator is seeing three other docs. So you just, sometimes you don't know. And the other thing is when you ask for records, I mean, you're relying on the parent or the caretaker to give you the names of the physicians for the records. Well, I think that needs to change then. So you can, you can certainly omit names of docs that you think might not help your case. But this to me just shows how much more we care about money than about people. Because if these were financial transactions, you've got the credit report, you've got records. Everything is so tightly managed. Well, but when you come to people and their needs, it's just... You're talking apples and oranges. I don't think so. I think we could handle people similarly if we cared as much as we do about money. (laughs) Well, good statement. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. So you don't think there's a way to fix this? Well, I think there is. For us to be able to have access to medical records in a more timely fashion. But why is that a problem? They should be able to have those electronically sent over immediately. Everybody has a computer. In theory. Yeah. But in practice, it's not a high priority. Well, that's what I'm saying. It needs to be. But although I do see what you're saying, that it's really rare. So it's not high on the priorities. Yes. But this is a horrible thing for a child to go through. Definitely. So it probably should be a priority. Well, it absolutely should be. Yeah. Uh, And again, I'm not trying to make excuses for the medical profession. I'm just trying to tell Richard that it might not be as easy to make a diagnosis of Munchausen by proxy as you would think. I could accept that, sure. Okay. But I just think these are highly educated people, and the medical profession should work together to find a solution to having accurate records. And of course, the neurologist was totally to blame, because he should have known that she didn't have muscular dystrophy, was it? Which was crazy. If a neurologist can't figure that out, something's seriously wrong. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard. We appreciate you listening and like the comments. Keep them coming. Yep. So we have another email from Robin. Yeah, this is the long one that I'm throwing to you. So Robin gave us some nice compliments in the beginning. If you want to edit things. I am. You certainly may. Okay. So it starts out with some nice compliments. Thank you, Robin. Yes, thank you. So Robin says, I'm writing from Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, where I listen to podcasts as I work on preparing fossils. Yours is one of my favorites, and I look forward to every new one. I lived for some years in Grand Prairie, Alberta, where I heard about an interesting historic case. This one is 100 years old now, and I'm not sure how deep into these historic cases you guys want to go. 
but I thought it might interest you. In 1918, six people were found dead, immigrant settlers in the rural area around Grand Prairie. There are two murder locations, two people dead and four people dead. A fire and some missing money in the mix, with no one charged in the end. Although there were suspects and an involved investigation, a local man wrote up a book about the entire thing called Foulest of Murders, the story of Grand Prairie's 1918 unsolved murder of six. If you end up doing this case, or any case from Alberta for that matter, may I highly recommend a Grand Prairie brewery called Grain Bin Brewing Company. I would recommend any and all of their beers, in particular, Willie the Wit Belgian-style wit beer and Barreled Wild Ale. They are yet a small company whose distribution is limited. If you decide to review their beer and have trouble finding it, please let me know and I can see what I can do about a beer exchange. That's awesome. So what do we know about this 1918 case? Sounds very fascinating. Doesn't it? So an amateur historian, Walter Tansom, had spent a decade looking into the biggest unsolved mass murder in Alberta history, a case that his family had talked about for years. So and he kept coming back to this question is, how is it that six men are killed and no one knows anything about it? First, it was assumed to be a murder-suicide. Bodies of Joseph Snyder and his nephew Stanley were found in the remains of their burnt-out shack near Grand Prairie. Both had been shot with a 38 revolver that had been found near the bodies. Now, six days later, people noticed a bad smell emanating from the farm down the road. Yes, so the first bodies were found inside the shack. Right. Ignaz Patan, the owner of the farm, lay on the floor beside John Woodwind. And then inside a wagon in the yard was Charles Zimmer, and Frank Parzachowski was found in the log storehouse. So one had his throat slit, the other three were each shot with a single bullet in the back of the head or in the eye. So that sounded more like an execution. It does. And this made the deaths of the Snyders that had been found before them a little more significant. Well, it changes the whole setup, doesn't it? Sure does. And the gun found at the Schneider shack belonged to Patton, and there were five empty shell casings inside. There was a ring of keys from the Patton house also found on the Schneider farm. So a newspaper story at the time says it's been the belief of the police that either Schneider or his nephew had slain the other and then committed suicide, but this new development may throw an entirely new light on the entire series of tragedies. The last time anyone saw Patton, Zimmer, or Wedwand alive, they were about to leave for Fort Vermilion to buy a new ranch. The, man, the men had saved up $5,000 for the purchase and had withdrawn all the money in cash from the Union Bank in Grand Prairie before their trip. Do we know how much $5,000 would be in today's money? Because I bet it would be a lot. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. The men also had some wood alcohol, and their friend joined them for a drink to say goodbye. After the murders, police found only $108 in the house and the rest of the money was gone. Then the bills started showing up in September. Ones, twos, fives, and $10 bills, all stained unmistakably with blood. The money was traced back to the Union Bank in Grand Prairie, but the teller couldn't remember who the money had come from. Some in town thought the bloody bills could have come from the butcher, but there were just so many of them, and they were all stained with blood. Of course, back then they couldn't tell if it was animal or people blood. But by the spring of 1920, police still hadn't made an arrest. Even an undercover police officer sent to Grand Prairie to get in with the foreigners, as they said, came up empty-handed. So despite having a long list of potential suspects and a $5,000 reward, the best detective John Nicholson could come up with was a circumstantial case against Dan Lau, who was a neighbor who had discovered the Schneider's bodies. Nicholson wasn't confident about the case, though, especially since there was absolutely no evidence linking Lowe to any of the killings. But he decided to charge Lowe anyway, and a jury took less than an hour to find Lowe not guilty. So there. <laughs> yeah. So then Nicholson charged another man with the murders based on information he got from Lowe, and those charges were dismissed after a preliminary hearing. Lowe was charged again in 1921, but then the charges were withdrawn. So no double jeopardy back then, huh? I guess. That's yeah. interesting. Maybe there wasn't. Plus, this is Canada. Yeah, that's true. Nicholson admitted investigators had been stumped by the sophistication of the crime. 
In 1951, a Grand Prairie man wrote a letter to police with a thought that had been weighing on his mind. Maybe a backwoods man did it, he suggested, slipping in with moccasins and leaving no trace. Royal Canadian Mounted Police officers who read the letter decided the man, like many others in the area, had merely treated the case as a murder mystery and had figured out a storybook solution. But he still wasn't the only one looking for an answer. More than 90 years later, the murders of these six men near Grand Prairie remains the largest unsolved mass murder in Alberta history. Provincial government historian David Leonard said he has been intrigued by the case, and he described it as the ultimate whodunit. He said it was a mystery that will probably never be solved. So it sounds fascinating. Doesn't it? The guy who was looking at this case had his own theory about the killer or killers, but he wanted people to come to their own conclusions. So we don't know who he thought. Well, why would he want people to come to their own conclusions? He wanted them to get his book and read it. <laughs> you think so? I don't know if that's the only reason. I don't know. But, but you know, what's fascinating about these older cases is finding out what laws were different, what technology wasn't there yet, because obviously it makes it harder to solve when you don't have DNA or anything, really. Yeah, no, I think it's a fascinating example. A hundred-year-old case, jeez. Well, you know, I bet Robin really likes the history because she works on fossils. Yes, she yeah. does. <laughs> okay. Is that it for feedback? That's it for feedback. All right. That's it for the week. Let's do this again next week. That sounds like a good idea. All right. So we will see you next week at the quiet end. We're getting close to Christmas. We are. And Nicolas Cage. Plus other ones. We got some good Christmas time crimes to talk about. Yeah. Do you want to tell the listeners what we're doing on Christmas Day? I think it'll have mixed opinions. We finally decided to look at John Benet Ramsey. We did a little 15 minute thing on one of our Christmas episodes a couple years ago. So we're going to give it the full treatment. And next week we're doing another one the Santa Claus murders that so. occurred in Santa Claus, Georgia. So, so we have a Christmas theme going on here. More or less. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time at the quiet end. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs>